Hi, and welcome back to Cultural Counterpower. I am Laura Rykovich, and I am broadcasting from the Francis Kite Club here in New York City. Today, we're going to be talking emancipatory propaganda with Jonas Stahl. And propaganda is obviously a big word, uh, and it has a lot of big feelings attached to it. And my special guest today is both an artist and the founder of the New World Summit. His name is Jonas Stahl, and he is also a dear friend of mine. And Jonas wrote a book um, called Propaganda Art in the 21st Century, which I find very inspiring for both its historical look at, or its look at historical um, uses of propaganda, the ways that propaganda is formulated, its power, its logics, um, and also for a very powerful provocation that for me has become a foundational aspect of how I think about the world, which is that Jonas poses this question. What if we created a propaganda that was not based on the accumulation and consolidation of power, but rather centered on a goal of mutual liberation. Could such an emancipatory propaganda reframe the way that we live and the way that we see our world today? I think this is really fruitful ground for discussion, and I hope you'll join me in the podcast to hear what we talk about. Hi, I'm Laura Rykovich, and welcome to Cultural Counterpower. We're broadcasting from the Francis Kite Club here in New York City, uh, which is also the the ancestral home of the Lenape people, uh, where I am fortunate to live and raise a family. And I want to just express my gratitude to the Lenape people for um, for stewarding this land since time immemorial. Today, my guest is artist and founder of the New World Summit, Jonas Stahl. And I first met Jonas over a decade ago in the early years of the summit, um, which and the, and the summit is a uh, artistic and political organization that develops parliaments and assemblies for stateless, with and for stateless, blacklisted and autonomous organizations. And he's recently created a parallel project called the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes that, in his words, is a more than human tribunal that aims to process prosecute climate crimes by states and corporations, not only in the past and present, but also in the future. I have participated in some of Jonas' summits um, and have witnessed the CICC, and they are, in my, in my estimation, not only uh, wonderful experiences, but pow also powers, powerful examples of collectively built ways of reimagining how we might live in our world, how we might express our culture, our power. And Jonas is not only the maker of these projects with his many collaborators, but he's also the author of this book, Cultural, uh, sorry, uh, Propaganda Art in the 21st Century. And I encourage you, he's done many other amazing things, and I encourage you to visit his website. So propaganda art in the 21st century is, to me, a touchstone that uh, that I've been relying on since the book came out, Jonas, actually since before the book came out, because I was lucky enough to read a draft of it. And, um, you know, not only is the book a really powerful and important review of the history of propaganda, its um, relationship to various movements, both on the left and on the right, um, the way it's been used um, throughout history. But it also poses an extremely important and provocative question, which is, what if there what if we could create a propaganda that was not based in the consolidation of power, but rather in the opposite, in a commitment to mutual liberation? What would that look like? What would that mean? Would that potentially uh, create a mode of reimagining our whole universe, of reimagining the way we relate to one another, of reimagining how we might construct a more viable, a more just political and social realm. And so 
I know that, um, you know, in your work, you have continued to consider these questions around propaganda. And I thought we could start um, with why you chose propaganda as a subject of study. And maybe we should start with how you define it. Yes, well, thank you, first of all, for having me. And it's a big pleasure to be in conversation again, in an ongoing conversation. Um, the the subject of propaganda for me is relevant because propaganda essentially is about world making. It, it, uh, the, I understand propaganda as <clears throat> the aim to construct um, a new reality. Uh, and that is not by definition um, an, an, an oppressive reality or an emancipatory reality. That's just what propaganda is. It, uh, it operates through, through infrastructure, through narrative and through imagination to create a new reality. And then with infrastructure, we can think of infrastructures of circulation uh, from mass media to educational institutions, like the infrastructures we need to introduce a certain story, a certain imaginary. The narrative is what is that story. Is that um, a story that tells us something about where we come from, who we are, who we are yet to become, or in the case of many of the ultra-nationalist and alt-right narratives, who we are supposed to, to become again. And the aspect of imagination is um, in propaganda relates to how through infrastructure and narrative we then visualize uh, a horizon of that uh, reality to come, or that reality to come yet uh, again. And for me, in every possible way that um, process of um, of, of uh, the, the making of propaganda relates to uh, to the field of culture and to the field of art specifically when it comes to narrative and imagination and the stories that we tell and and the the worlds that that we imagine into being and in a way propaganda maybe helps us to understand how powerful um, art and culture really is that in order to change the world we will need an imagination of that and that of that world that we want to change first uh, and as such imagination is never neutral and is never innocent um, and maybe that's both the um, excitement and somehow also the danger of um, of what we do as cultural workers that the imaginaries we open are like seeds like a kind of time seeds that we plant and once we plant something in the imagination um, it's uh, it's possible becoming is um, uh, has begun. It, it, it's possible to sow to propagate in the biological sense of the term, uh, that time seed, that seed of the imagination uh, later on. Um, I I particularly love uh, this idea of planting the seed through uh, an artwork. Um, you know, and I've been thinking actually a lot about where the art happens. Um, you know, when an artwork is conceived, when it's materialized, when it's when it has people to interact with it, when it's remembered. There are all these kind of points at which that uh, that seed uh, might begin germinating right um and so the idea of um you know that seed being propaganda or being um you know an incitement to create a new world is, is to me a very exciting idea and um, i'm gonna read from just a small snippet from from your book because i think that uh that the, that this is why from a practical perspective even though this sound this kind of terminology sounds very um aspirational uh you know idealistic perhaps even a bit utopian it's actually really grounded in the way our politics are playing out in this very moment. And, you know, you write, um, reactivating propaganda and propaganda art studies can be only one part of the answer to our present day crises, conflicts, and deepening precarity. Yes, we need to understand who authors our world in our name, who authors our world in our name. But we also need to gain control over the means of production through which our realities are constructed in order to make new ones. And I think that is a very concise analysis, actually, of our current political condition, uh, particularly in relationship to the the kind of fascist and right wing turn in um, in. Um, in governments and politics around the world. And I wanted to talk kind of specifically about how this is unfolding, both in the United States and Europe, as 
that's where we both sit. Um, and, you know, and, and how, how we see, to maybe describe how we see the right kind of uh, executing this uh, or displaying a really profound facility with world defining and how we might counter that, you know, and, and what is that, what might that look like? I, I partially wrote this book, Propaganda Art in the 21st Century, to, um, to challenge a very narrow definition of, of propaganda in which propaganda is always and only attributed to authoritarian regimes and dictatorships of the past and it would somehow no longer be applicable to our present and, and uh, somehow not have um, a, a logic that denies the emancipatory heritage that propaganda has as well, the role propaganda has played in uh, in the socialist movements, in civil rights, black liberation, feminist, ecological movements, um, how propaganda was theorized from the perspective of national liberation movements, etc. But um, that doesn't mean that this oppressive dimension of propaganda is not also very much part of this larger, of the larger history of propaganda. And um, and as you as you say, I think at this moment we are witnessing a various um, fascisms uh, uh, converging which have neo-fascism neo -fascisms converging, which have understood profoundly that culture and narrative is a, um, are detrimental to uh, establishing a new, a new hegemony. Um, and that um, artists and theater makers and game designers are a critical component to that. Um, and, and, and I call this in a way the shadow art world. Like we live in, we operate in one art world, a critically engaged, socially engaged art world, which certainly has certain impacts. But I think in, it oftentimes is also quite naive when it comes to understanding the, the real, the means of production that are necessary to produce a reality that, and that, 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 that manifests itself concretely for, for the many. And the shadow art world, uh, is an art world that consists of the, the cinematic work of um, Steve Bannon, the ideologue of, uh, of Donald Trump. You would say former ideologue, but I'm not convinced that that is really the case. I would say continuous ideologue and propagandist for, for Trump, who, who built a cinematic oeuvre of 20 years and um, in which he tested, he tried and tested all the narratives we have come to know and know as Trumpism. First, uh, in relationship to the, the the heritage of Reagan and the paleoconservative wing of the, of the Republican Party, then for a Tea Party figureheads like Sarah Palin, then Trump, which he himself calls an imperfect vehicle. Here we have a propaganda artist who has been trying and testing um, Trumpism, uh, white economic uh, nationalism, white Christian economic nationalism, this doctrine, um, even before Trumpism came into uh, Trump came into on, onto the political stage. So we see that imagination precedes, prefigures reality. And something similar happens with the um, science fiction writers that are currently employed by the French Minister of uh, French Ministry of Defense, um, which um, uh, asks these specific science fiction writers to develop scenes, like to write scenarios of possible future conflicts for uh, the military to anticipate on how to deal with uh, future cyber confrontations with uh, the Chinese People's Republic and you name it. Of course, the difficulty of that is that the moment that our infrastructures begun, military infrastructures start to anticipate threats that are not yet there, we also create the possibilities of, of threats to come into being. And this is a strange thing that I would call the rogue imaginary and uh, that, that is also a part of, uh, of, of propaganda that. So, so what you're saying is in a way, the, the, uh, the mere imagining of it might make it come into being. The mere suggestion of it by these kind of actors who are, who are being invited to imagine something so that it can be defended against by the military or by some other state agent, actually might actually might actualize it and i would say generally and generally probably something worse because that's what a rogue imaginary is you you imagine a threat first and then once that that threat actually becomes starts to manifest through your imagination it might take off and become something far worse so um when um the war on the so-called war on terror began this almost you know, this dystopian utopian war because in a way it, it strove for a world without terror a fretless world 
Um, but the, the, the way to fight this terror was through perpetual terror that created the conditions uh, for organizations like the Isla Islamic State to emerge out of the black sites um, in, uh, in Iraq and the destabilization after the invasion and occupation of Iraq. Um, the Islamic State, if, if we wouldn't have a, a trajectory leading to it, it's, it's almost unimaginable. Like if, if the Islamic State would emerge in a, in a pre-2001 uh, Hollywood film, we would say it's, it's simply obscene. It's an obscene imagination. It's a caricature. It's a, it's an, it's it's offensive. It's like it's it's an it's unimaginable in a way. It's unimaginable to be real, and this is what I mean with rogue imagination. That a fight against a form of terror that didn't exactly exist in the way that the Bush regime at the time was claiming it did, came into being through fighting a non-existing terror. Something much worse came into came into being. And so, in this kind of space of the rogue imagination. Um, you know, we seem to consistently see the forces of oppression using these methodologies extremely su successfully, whether it's intentional or not, as you kind of point out, that this can actually come about in a kind of unintentional, intentional way. <laughs> um, how do you use that same propaganda's technique towards emancipation, towards getting that mask of populism to drop? I mean, when you study propaganda, like a figure like, like Bannon, for example, there's often these moments where you're tricked into thinking, why don't we have a left Bannon? Why don't we have an emancipatory Bannon? Someone just as cunning, capable of like shamelessly appropriating the infrastructures necessary to redistribute wealth and collectivize common resources. And, but of course, um, propaganda might exist in, in all forms of political, in the context of all political ideologies. But the things that you believe about the reality you want to construct do inform how you construct it. You can't manipulate yourself away into uh, an, an emancipatory world. The, it, it, I think the history of emancipatory propaganda um, is, is always based on the idea of collective propagation, not about mass manipulation, but about collective emancipation. Um, and that makes uh, emancipatory propaganda always more complex. Maybe this is our part of our part of our struggle: is that the types of narratives that we have to tell about the worlds that we that we want to create are can't rely on some um, nostalgic reconstruction of a past that well never existed, and also even if it even if it existed, shouldn't be resurrected. Emancipation is always based on this paradox of becoming something that you cannot yet know in the current conditions of oppression. It's always about creating a world in which liberation means liberating yourself from something that oppresses you also in the here and now. So what we might become together through an emancipatory propaganda is always something that is partially to be known um, as, as part of that process. But it's a more difficult, it's a more complex narrative to, um, to propagate, to seed, uh, than that of, uh, of, of the return to to a safer, uh, to the idea of a safer past, especially in a world that is so perpetually plagued by, by crisis as the one that we find ourselves in today. Yeah, and I think this point is, is extremely important because um, it is the collective commitment to an emancipatory propaganda, let's say, um, in all of its diversity and in all of the ways in which we might approach that question of what is an emancipatory propaganda differently uh, that makes it that that makes it effective potential that makes it potentially effective right like it is not one idea you know a la the bannon type of world rewriting or remaking but it is a multiplicity of ideas that need to be hashed out in real time um and uh in 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 a in a space of difference, right? I mean, I, I think that that's, that's a core piece of um, the challenge of what an emancipatory propaganda might look like. And so it then becomes a question of like, how does that get cultivated in multiple realms? And perhaps, 
you know, in spaces of multiplicity as you have constructed through the New World Summit and the assemblies and the parliaments that the summit has convened, um, but also obviously in multiple um, manifestations of uh, of what uh, of, uh, of cultural storytelling, of cultural um, invention. So that it's it's not all coming out of like one mind that's you know say, telling us what the story should be. It's the multiplicity of minds that is important to this potential future emancipatory propaganda. Yes, and that's why it's important that we organize in the here and now because I think organizing is uh, essentially and it is act of collective prefiguration of the world that we want and that we begin to see it in the present and that's what i mean with that an immense an immense to create an emancipatory reality needs an emancipatory propaganda cannot mimic the tactics of oppressive and manipulative propaganda of our opponents it means that already in the here and now and um, transparently and collectively we start to create the worlds that we want to see and you referenced uh, the black panther party as an uh, as an example that I also uh, uh, write about in my book and a figure like Emery Douglas, the, the minister of uh, former minister of culture of the Black Panther Party. Emery Douglas was not um, an artist who who by himself um, proposed an imaginary of a world to 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 come. He he um, he depicted the world at present, the, the structural oppression and in the, and and the institutionalized white supremacy in the. In the U.S. Uh, uh, state apparatus, um, but he also imagined the world of liberation to come, and he did so within the context of a of a party that was an organization that uh, produced culture, that produced a new form of public culture through the uh, journals that he oversaw, the poster production, the murals, the workshops with uh, with uh, uh, children and and young people and young artists through internationalist exchanges. Um, Emery Douglas always referenced the work of, national, of artists in national liberation movements from Cuba to, to Vietnam. So he also saw his struggle, his cultural work as part of a larger uh, historical and contemporary uh, cultural dialogue. And it was inherently tied to uh, wings that went from um, uh, the, the, the breakfast program, the food program for, uh, for children and communities that the Black Panther Party organized and the capability to organize self-defense for communities uh, systemically uh, faced with, uh, with uh, police violence and murder. So his work was intrinsically tied to this organizational pre prefiguration, one that was able to confront real oppressions and struggles of the present um, without ever abandoning the creation of horizon of where that organization would um, uh, possibly uh, where it could lead to what kind of reality it could seed in the in the near future and i think that's that's exactly a, a model that um that is a model of the recent past but that that is very much an example of of the challenge that we face as well to link our imaginary uh, competences uh, and uh, qualities as, as artists and cultural workers to organizing work to the collective imaginary of of constructing a, a reality anew. And I think that this is so profoundly important and relevant, particularly to the climate emergency, because as we've seen for decades, the denial of all the facts and proof and all of this. And what's clear is that um, there is a lot of work that has been done on the more kind of ex emotional and um, experiential side of things that has made far more headway in terms of um, convincing the general public to understand climate emergency as such. And so I guess, you know, maybe we can talk a little bit about um, the court for in intergenerational climate crimes as a tool for getting into that space that you're talking about of both contending with deep past, but also the future in the very real present. I mean, I think maybe talk a little bit about what that project does, did, does, uh, and performs, because I, I think there's something in that that is so telling about the kind of time frames on which we're, you, you're talking about here, where like the pre-enactment relates to how you function today, and yet it is also profoundly about pasts and potential futures. 
Yeah, so the, the court for intergenerational climate crimes is, is what I call an organizational art project, so an artwork in the form of an alternative organizational model, in this case, a court, that I initiated together with a lawyer, Rada de Souza, lawyer, writer, uh, activist, academic. And um, we um, created this court to prosecute uh, climate criminals, corporations and state implicated in climate crimes in past, present, but also future. So what we're trying to confront through an alternative legal framework that Rada developed based on much of her so case, case history as a lawyer called the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act 2021 is a, is a legal, an alternative legal framework that um, takes, can, that, can, that, can, that acknowledges the future uh, as plaintiff. Um, so at present in our pre existing legal system, uh, the future doesn't exist. You can only prosecute uh, criminals based on crimes of the past that can be that have to be uh, brought in front of the court uh, through evidence in the present. The future, unborn human plants animals, um, they do not exist. They are they do not have rights. They are rightless in this uh, in this context. Even though we know that the climate criminals um, are currently committing ecocide, omnicide uh, on this very future. That this, uh, that this is the, the reality is and uh, the, the, the death of millions through mass suffocation, mass burning, mass drowning. We know it, we have the evidence for it, um, but we cannot prosecute uh, on behalf of the future. And in the alternative legal framework that we propagate through the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes, through our lawyers, through our public prosecutor, through, through our uh, through our judges and, and the audience who in our courts become public jury, um, does um, recognize uh, uh, this uh, unborn life, uh, the rights of the future. This is not to be confused with the way that evangelists um, have been uh, propagating against uh, the, um, uh, the, the, um, the right to abortion. And, and the right to, to bodily autonomy. Um, this has to do with uh, the, 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 the right of life to exist, of life to propagate, for the conditions of life to live. This is, in, in essence, uh, what the, the um, Intergenerational Climate Crimes uh, Act represents. And I also think what's fascinating about that is that you're also granting rights, um, in a sense, to the, the extinct. Right. I mean, they're witnesses in a way. Um, your, your paintings of the of the extinct species that no longer walk this earth as kind of co-plaintiffs, perhaps, or witnesses of some kind. Uh, I mean, that's how I interpret the the, the kind of extinct uh, species that are involved in this project, where you've actually painted these animals uh, and uh, life forms that no longer occupy, that, that no longer live, uh, can live on this earth, um, as present in the proceedings, as witnesses, as um, um, co-plaintiffs, I don't know, as 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 presences that uh, that have um, an influence over this 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 kind of legal process. Yes, Rada and I decided that we wanted to build the, the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes in its manifold iterations because we have been organizing public hearings from, from Amsterdam to, to Guangzhou um, out of evidence of climate crimes. Um, and the evidence out of which we build the courts are, as you, as you mentioned, depictions of animals and plants that have gone extinct from colonization onwards to the present. Um, and that shows them. The archive of extinctions of our world shows that um, mass extinctions began not in the industrial period, but began with in, in the colonial period. And as such, we argue that climate crisis is a colonial crisis, is a product of turning the world um, uh, into, into property, uh, into turning living beings into, into, into property. And with the mass extinction of animals and plants, we also witnessed the mass extinction, the forced extinction. Um, of cultures, of languages, uh, of the very memory of the of the world that you acknowledged uh, the moment that you acknowledged the land that uh, that uh, that from where you are speaking at this moment in our um, in our conversation. So for us, that was very important that the the the, content, the evidence of historical climate crimes would be present, uh, constitutive of the court, and as such that 
and, and in that way would also make present our non-human ancestors, our non-human comrades as part of a struggle in the present for uh, the possibility to live in the in the future. We try to do that without speaking of rights. Um, Rada has, uh, um, my collaborator, has developed a long and profound critique of the very concept of, of rights from the idea that uh, rights always assume a proper proprietary, proprietary relationship uh, to the world. Um, so she believes that it is possible to constitute a new law, a new legal imaginary without uh, speaking of, uh, of rights um, as such. But as you notice in this conversation, even for me, it's sometimes difficult to, to let go. Yeah. We've be become so accustomed to thinking of rights as something uh, that has an emancipatory uh, dimension of it to it as well. Right. And I think that this question of rights and uh, who's granted rights and who isn't or what, um, you know, because I, I think that one of the things that you are pointing to in this project is that um, non-human entities also have um, agency in this um, in this way of storytelling, right? Um, that that is really important. And I think to tie it to tie it back to kind of how this is a reimagination, not only this conversation around rights, right, which is about re rethinking how we imagine what is possible from an emancipation or liberatory perspective, right? Um, but also, you know, that that kind of takes as a starting point, not um, where we currently are, but where we will be if we continue on this path. And I think that there's a, a kind of, um, that you need to get people to buy into that in some way. Like, you need to, in order for somebody to kind of understand what the court is doing, right, you need to uh, create a certain set of circumstances that people say, okay, well, it is possible that humans won't survive, and so therefore this court makes sense. So how do you, with with a, you know, and this is to me like a, kind of a piece of the propaganda situation because it's like even within this one artwork you have to kind of create the conditions where somebody could even understand the terms that you're talking about right so like somebody walking into the the court um has to appreciate you know that uh this is a court that's going to determine how um how the future unfolds um and so how do you bring people into that you know how how what's what was you, what is your approach to bringing people into that conversation to kind of like knock down that first domino that allows the kind of rest of the story to unfold what's the point of entry i mean i think a project like the court for intergenerational climate crimes has many um, has many points of entry like the court as we discuss it now the actual public the, the six to eight hour public hearings that we organize in which um people who are normally members of the public become members of a public jury who are required to study the intergenerational climate crimes act who listen through detailed testimony and evidence of our um, of our plaintiffs uh, who then have to test and uh, link that to the legal framework that is presented to them in order to come to a judgment the apparatus of the court that uh, produces detailed judgments and, um, and and documentation of all of these uh, proceedings of course this is a extremely in intensive uh, intensive process that is not that 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 engages climate activists and uh, progressive scientists and policy makers and our, our juries are people with all, that have a stake in this uh, in this struggle of course the image of the court is something that that circulates already much wider and like it, it can be as simple as a sentence did you know there's this court it prosecutes climate criminals for the future in, in as a in as a kind of parallel to to maybe uh, kim stanley robinson's uh, ministry of the future and uh, something that in only a few sentence in a few sentences uh, can evoke uh, the image of of something else and and in which it can be shown that it that it even exists like if, if you when you visit our courts you visit the court we have prosecuted airbus ing group uh unilever the dutch state and you enter into a space in which these proceedings take place they are material they, they are material in reality they are as real as we are collectively willing to perform them into being and this is of course the truth of all of our institutions right. and i think what you're doing in a kind of uh maybe in a 
10,000 feet way is taking a structure, a, a cultural infrastructure, meaning the court system, a system of justice or a theoretical system of justice and transforming it, uh, taking it and, and transforming the idea of what that is, the ideal, into something that could actually perform something that is more just than the current courts at our disposal. It is, it is depending on whether a, a collective of people would decide it to be so, it would be the it would be the courts that we all need, but that we don't that we don't have. Wow. And when our existing courts um, are turning into <clears throat> obscene theaters that are essentially defending the rights of the people who are burning our futures more than the people who are being burned, that is the moment to transform our theaters into the courts that we actually need. We can we can reappropriate that process and turn it into something else. In the end, constitutions and, and, and legal documents are just scripts and the spaces in which they are enacted are theaters, are spaces that are built through architecture, through visual imagination, and uh, from judges to politicians, they are all actors performing a script. That doesn't mean that, that this is not a, a theater, a, per, a performance that doesn't have a profound impact on reality. It shows exactly that imagination directly shapes and constitutes reality. But it also shows that if we no longer agree with the way that we are governed, if we no longer agree with the, the inherent criminality of our law, that we can write the law differently, that we can enact it differently. And what we are trying to do, what Rada and me are trying to do as part of a much larger climate justice movement is to contribute an imagination to prove in a way, to give evidence that if we want that court, that court for the future, the court for intergenerational climate crimes to become real, it can be done. Like we're proving that it can be done. If we collectively decide for it to become real, it is as real as we want it to be. Exactly. And I think that that is the thing that this court makes visible, perhaps in some ways, is the inherent injustice of the current court. Right. I, I mean, I think that there is a, a clear, a very clear difference between the two, even if they are, uh, even if they both are using these theatrical uh, modes of, of of operating. And I think that's also very useful that you're taking something that's super familiar, but that people perhaps have a different expectation of what might come out of it to invert that into a, uh, a different kind of um, outcome. Sitting here today, especially thinking, you know, I've been, I was, I was reading this morning a an article about the the kind of um, the anti-fascist uh, protests that have been unfolding all over Germany these last uh, weeks, um, and really thinking about, you know, um, the this idea of how populist rhetoric has become this kind of mask that is worn by um, by oligarchs and um, and politicians who wish to appeal to a broad base, while in fact pursuing their own very selfish goals of essentially, I mean, that can be summarized by the consolidation of wealth and power, which has been the, the, the kind of traditional uh, use of propaganda. <laughs> um, and, and, and thinking about how, um, how, 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 how mass protest movements also uh, enact a kind of emancipatory propaganda um, because they, they release that mask. They, they show that it is not necessarily true and real. And I think one of the things that really impacted me about, you know, how these protests are unfolding in, in Germany today and also how the, the massive uh, and historic Black Lives Matter protests unfolded here in the United States um, was just the sheer quantity and the sheer number of people who were denying that other reality. Um, and I think that this goes straight to your point about uh, emancipatory propagandas and that, you know, it is these collective uh, and bottom up efforts that reveal themselves to be another reality that is possible. There's something, there's a connection that I want to make between the fact that the idea of the nation state is an out of date construct, that it is actually 
a complete invention and a fallacy that every time we see people crossing geographies, whether it's due to climate or economic emergency or, or war, some combination of all of those factors, that we understand that these are all fictions. And, that, and how do we reconstruct realities to reflect that these are fictions rather than uh, something that need to be guarded? Yes, yes. Well, let's say it, <clears throat> the, the, nations, the, the nation states that are the inheritors of empire indeed inflict this perpetual violence upon the world and this causes the very conditions for for um, uh, forced mass mi migration that you're that you're describing i mean i think one one angle could be to redefine the narrative of um of uh, of what we what we want um, our um, <laughs> what we want our states to be maybe as uh, as cooperatives for example like maybe I would rather speak of a, of a Dutch cooperative than I want to speak of the Dutch state or the Dutch nation, because I think once you start, I mean, the existence of a state apparatus, you can concretely infrastructurally argue for to a certain extent, because it's supposed sovereignty is, of course, is, is of course a fiction. Um, the, the nation already becomes much more problematic. I would much, much rather want to look at the possible, the possible cooperative coalitions and relationships that allow for to hold common means of um, of production of our community of of the production of energy resources of food resources of um, the the distribution of um, trans the infrastructure for uh, transportation and mobility and accessibility from a cooperative point of view. I find it more logic. I find it I find it more um, more rational. I find it more just. It comes closer to my idea of what what the community. What the community really is, as a collective of of workers, as a collective of earth workers, which might include, um, uh, which 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 goes beyond uh, um, uh, humans alone, but uh, all of our fellow earth workers with which we try to maintain a livable biosphere. So, part part of the response is also: can we produce the the narratives and imaginations of of what we used to call our states to to become something else, maybe something that we can already begin to enact in the very present, because most of the time, the state is nowhere to be seen in any case. Most of the time, and for most people, we rely on each other and on the relationships of trust that exist within the place-based community in which we operate. But most of the time, there is not really a state apart from as a kind of, as a kind of hovering, as a, as a governing concept rather than as a practical reality. So, so even from that from that practical experience of reality and those relations of, of trust that make up the, the intimacy of our actual live li lived lives, there might already be the seed in our very in our very lived reality of how that reality could be organized differently. Well, and I like how you've just tied uh, the, this back to the beginning of our conversation when we started talking about seeding ideas um, and uh, germinating those um, in different contexts. Um, and maybe that this is a good place for us to finish our conversation, even though it feels like we've only just begun. <laughs> because um, um, I love what you have to say about uh, emancipatory propaganda, Jonas. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I also think that there is so much left to be said around how that is activated in a political space, social space, economic space that is profoundly unequal um, and inequitable and, and, and how we begin to reimagine those spaces as we want to live in them. And there seem to be a few routes to do that, uh, multiple, many multiple routes to do that, but it begins with the imagination. It begins with us thinking afresh about how we want to be in the world, because if we can't imagine it at the end of the day, how might we, how, how can we even, how can we even hope to realize it? So thank you very much. And um, I look forward to talking to you again soon.